Rage Patrick Gaming here, and we're doing another Frosthaven character guide. Yay! This time, we're doing another one of my favorite starting classes in Frosthaven, the Deathwalker. It has a low health pool and a hand size of 11. Um, however, it's kind of like a hybrid uh, ranged melee striker, and we're going to actually be talking about two builds today, a melee focused build and a ranged focused build. And I want to kind of emphasize both of them because I think the style of play changes heavily. And there's a little bit more nuance of the melee build, but I do think it does uh, more effort, but it does uh, put you at more risk because you have the low health progression and trying to get into melee with a little bit of um, asterisks in your attacks while also being low health is pretty big. So if this is something like this class looks cool to you and you're like, I want to try it and this is fun and you're not sure you're ready to take it, the range build is easier to play. Just want to put that out there. Remember to like and subscribe if you want more Frosthaven content. The Deathwalker focuses on a mechanic called Shadows. Shadows are largely created via Call to the Abyss, but there's a handful of other cards, such as Abyss and some of the other cards you'll unlock later that allow you to create shadows. Shadows don't uh, take up a hex, they just uh, appear on the board when you create them, and they are often used as a resource for certain cards, or certain cards will require you to be in a shadow, your ally to be in a shadow, enemies to be in or adjacent to shadows, and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of times you'll be able to move shadows about the board, and shadows don't, uh, since they don't occupy hexes, you can move them through anything, and it's pretty nice. In addition, you'll be able to unlock a few teleports, allowing you to uh, effectively interact with um, those. But we want to first talk about Call to the Abyss as a card. It's a core card for the class because it's basically mandatory. It's one of the only ways to reliably produce shadows at any level, really. But um, the bottom card is a non-loss, just create a shadow. That's The bottom half is nice. However, a lot of times you'll want to use the top half. It's not saying that the top half is mandatory because you can absolutely find other ways to get shadows, especially if you're not going to be burning shadows, which the melee build largely doesn't. You might be able to. However, I still play the top half and largely most of the time on most spells and most scenarios. But the, it just allows you to, if you kill an enemy, you create a shadow in their spot. If you attack an enemy but don't kill them, you mark them and then if they would die for another reason later, the shadow drops in their spot. You can only have one enemy tagged in this fashion at a time. The nuance largely comes into the fact you have shadow interaction or you need shadows to be where you want or you need to have enough shadows in play. And then you will also need the, to interact with the dark element for several of your cards. So you're balancing two things, and I think for some people it's a little bit of a, a difficult class to play. It's not, I don't think it's very difficult to get a handle of the range class, because frankly you're largely just going to be um, dropping, some, dropping some shadows, uh, interacting with them, maybe letting your allies kill them, and then kind of burning them all, soaking them up with various cards, which we're going to be looking at a couple cards that kind of soak them up. So. Here's the melee build cards. We're going to go over to why we picked all of them as I go through every card one at a time. But the melee build largely focuses on using Strength of the Abyss. Strength of the Abyss allowing you to get... Um, it's very easy to pull off attack 6 non-loss at level 1, which is incredibly powerful. I love that. And there's other cards you'll be getting later that allow you to do that. There's there's going to be some other things that we're going to be doing with the melee build because it's not just hey we get one card that allows us to attack six don't worry there's more to it than that but uh we'll be we we'll talking about that once we get more into the melee build the range build largely focuses on getting the shadows where you want them and burning them so the range build will consume more shadows and the melee build will largely leave more shadows on the board the range build here you can see has not only lots of ranged attacks, but some shadow attacks that operate through your shadows. One of the big hitters here is Fluid Knight, which is not a star for the melee build, but for the range build it's pretty great, since a lot of times you'll be able to either kill the enemy, so you burn a shadow just to create a shadow right next to where it was, or you'll be able to hit an enemy, make it very hurt, and then tag it, allowing an, one of your friends to clean it up later and getting another shadow. So usually gives you a gives you just as many shadows as you spent, which is great. And often you'll be able to create other shadows with some of the dark spending cards like Black Barrage, which has a, not only a great range, but allows you to convert dark into an attack, and then you'll be able to tag an enemy, turning that enemy hopefully into a shadow after it dies. So focusing first on Call to the Abyss. Call to the Abyss is used in both builds. Um, primarily you want to play the top card. If you're like confused on what should I do, just play the top half 
because every time you attack and you have lots of attacks, you'll be able to generate shadows. So you can possibly turn every turn into a shadow production, potentially. Now you're gonna be spending some shadows during those turns, so it's not like you're constantly creating a shadow every turn. You'll be needing rests and you'll have some dead turns, but, um, and sometimes you'll just be attacking an enemy you already have tagged. So it's not all the time, but it really, really helps out. Um, the bottom is not bad if you just, if you know that the scenario may not result in something you need, like you can just create a, uh, create a shadow and then like you can use the top half of Eclipse to generate four shadows. So boom, you have one on the bottom here, three on the top of Eclipse, and boom, you have four shadows. You may not need that many for the course of a scenario if you know that the scenario let you, lets you know this scenario is going to end very quickly. Some of them literally give you a round limit. And so um, you, you might consider using the bottom half, especially if you unlock some of the other cards later with uh, Fleeting Dusk and Call of the Abyss if you use them in tandem allows you to every rest cycle just generate two without using a loss. This does require you to burn a couple turns just doing nothing with your bottom halves, but it does mean that you aren't burning a loss and you're just generating shadows constantly without you having to rely on tagging these enemies. I'm still not sure I like that strategy that much, but it is an option if you like it. Call of Doom. Call of Doom is a pretty solid card if only for the bottom. The 32 initiative isn't terrible. It goes before a lot of the attacks in the game, but not too many. Ultimately, just focus on the bottom, which says move three and fuse dark. This gives you not only move three, which is pretty solid, and the melee build will need this more because you will need more movement as melee, but it also gives you a non-loss and fuse dark on bottom at level one, which is important for both builds. The top, however, allows you to effectively create a blossom of seven hex attack ones. It's not great, but if dark's in play, you can also muddle every enemy that survives the attack, and they most often will. However, it is a non-loss seven hex attack, so you might get lucky and if there's a bunch of enemies out, you could potentially push a lot of damage. Uh, ultimately, I like rely on the bottom of this, but we've seen the top half end up being pretty powerful, especially if we end up getting buffs from some of the other classes. Fluid Knight. Fluid Knight's one we're going to drop quickly on the melee build, but we're going to keep it along a long time in the range build. Uh, effectively says you need a you need an enemy in or adjacent to a shadow, so you're going to need a lot of shadow movement. Uh, and then you perform an attack five and infuse dark and gain an experience all in one card. So first off, non-loss infuse dark, great. Getting an experience, great. Non-loss attack five at any range as long as you can get a shadow next to them, great. It only costs you to burn that shadow. If you have Call of the Best top in play, it will allow you to get that shadow back with the range build. Unfortunately, the melee build, which wants to build up these shadows for certain cards, mostly Strength of the Abyss at level one, but as we get to level three and on, you're gonna want to either be standing in shadows or, uh, no, it's, I think it's level two. Yeah, it's level two and on. You'll either, you'll want to be standing in shadows or have more shadows next to the enemy. So you want more shadows on the board. So constantly burning them to get them back is not a good strategy. So we're gonna drop Fluid Knight pretty early on the melee build, but the ranged build will absolutely use this for a long time because frankly, you just wanna get shadows into place, burn them, create more, and just create that infinite cycle of cycling through the shadows. Dark Fog. Dark Fog is something we're gonna drop earlier in the melee build because it's still good. Don't get me wrong, the top half's usable for anything. Uh, you do a bunch of attack threes and you curse anything that survives. It's a loss. It's not amazing, but it's still pretty solid. It, it's a pretty decent... Sparta. Oh my God, Spartacus is yelling at me. Dark Fog, so so the top half of Dark Fog is useful for anything. And in certain scenarios, it's actually going to be pretty incredible. The bottom half's really useful for the range build because you can just get a shadow where you need it to be and then like either blow it up because you have several cards that say like just bomb a shadow and you have, or just get a fluid knight in a position, which is fantastic. The melee build, however, you will often need to move yourself and move shadow. So any card that allows you to do both, from, from my personal experience, that seemed to be the key to the melee build is getting them. And there's gonna be another card we're gonna get unlocking later, which gives you free shadow movement. But for the range build, the bottom half is critical to getting that in position. And we're gonna keep this around for a long time. Eclipse is important for both builds. It's not as important for the range build because the range build uh, burning a loss to just create three shadows is something you may not need three shadows on the board. You may only need one or two at a time, uh, but it's still useful. And move, move four is universally useful. The melee build, getting a move four is important, so important. So we're always, we're gonna be keeping this around for a while. We will get another move later and that will replace it. But this is one of those that just because of its bottom. Not only that, but sometimes if you want early initiatives and later initiatives, this later initiative gives you a very nice, uh, in terms of the initiative spread. Um, I ultimately think that Eclipse is one of the cards that you keep for most of your career. Actually, 
I think every time we played this, it's like a, a test run where we were trying to run through, like test out the early part of a campaign just to see how balance was. I don't think any of those death walkers we used ended up dropping Eclipse. I think it was only in the late game. So I think most people starting out picking up their death walker until its first retirement will hold on to this card just because move four with the late initiatives is just strong in anything. And the top half is situationally useful for a lot of scenarios. Lingering Rot. Um, I love the bottom for the melee build. First off, get in a position to poison the enemy. So if you need to, like, get in position, poison an enemy, you can then toss Strength of the Abyss. If Strength of the Abyss in this allows you to get pretty easily an attack 7 non-loss at level 1. Move up to them, poison them, and attack them. Now you don't have to do that necessarily in one round because the initiatives on those two cards are kind of like in the middle and leaves you susceptible to the whims of the enemy. So I'm not suggesting that you necessarily play both in the same turn. You can. But if you uh, are able to move late uh, with the Lingering Rot, poison the enemy, and then go early with one of your other cards to use Strength of the Abyss early, you might be able to tag an enemy with a pretty big hit. And a lot of times because the melee build does these big hits, you'll be able to kill the enemies before they attack you back. The range build still can potentially move and poison, um, uh, but the top is actually pretty powerful. So if you can get those enemies right into position, first off, you could every every enemy in the hex and adjacent to the hex, seven hexes, attack three on all of them, and then remove the shadow and lose this card. It does allow you to turn that into two experience though, so that's nice. Every enemy that survives this big attack three blossom gets poisoned though. So then now, even if they do survive, which they, attack three is not like big, it does poison all of them. And this, will, a lot of times, I've, I would follow this up with like Forceful Spirits being able to toss a couple of attack threes that would turn into attack fours and quickly just drop rooms and allow any, our allies to just move in there and try to clean stuff up. So I, I really like the top half and the range build. It's still usable in the melee build, but a lot of times you don't want to burn so many losses as we go through later the melee build will burning will be burning more persistent losses and you'll you'll largely be relying on the bottom so um they're both situational i'm not sure i like it as much for the range i will still love the top for the range build but um because the bottom half isn't as useful the move three is still pretty solid for any build though Black Barrage. Moving two shadows is great for any build it doesn't matter but the melee build will rotate it out actually the melee build won't really the melee build just can't use this uh, moving two shadows such a short distance isn't going to help you without moving you. So we're just going to cut it. The, however, the range build could use that. And not only that, but it gives you a very strong non-shadow reliant top attack. So Black Barrage is in a range 4 or range 5, which is huge. That's a, such a good range. And it's a... And it's an attack 2 or an attack 3. Obviously, you'll want to do it with dark. But sometimes, if you don't have... Uh, dark in play, just a long range attack too is pretty solid. With Call to the Abyss in play, you can turn the enemy into a shadow potentially later. Strength of the Abyss primarily serves the melee build because uh, you attack one plus the number of shadows you have on the board. And this is largely why we want to have a lot of shadows in the melee build. And we'll get into that later as we get to un unlock the level two and three cards. Um, and as well as one of the perks as why you want shadows on the board. Um, but even the bottom half of this isn't very useful for the range build and obviously you don't want to get melee and you're probably going to be consuming too many shadows in the range to really use the top. Shadow Step. Um, it's weird because at later levels Shadow Step isn't great but in at early levels it's okay but in the kind of in the middle levels it ends up being better. It's largely because it's hard to use at, low, at level one but as you start to get the ability to move things more often and mobilize yourself you can get shadows where you want them. And the range build doesn't use this that much. So we, we, I mean, it's just not as useful. But the melee build will use it. So as long as you get a shadow in the right spot, it's a top half, move three, attack three, which is great. Even at worst, it's just an attack three on top, which isn't great. But at the very least, if you have an enemy next to a shadow because you've set it up somehow, you can just move three, attack three, and still use a bottom for another thing, which is pretty solid. Sunless Apparition, this is one thing I actually do like. I did use it a little bit on the melee build because it does allow you to give you another body that does go ahead of you. It does require you to burn a shadow, which is not great. However, uh, every time your summon attacks, you do get to tag an enemy, and every time you do so, so you could potentially uh, be able to still keep the train running. Uh, and although it does give you a teleport on bottom, you'll have another teleport from another card. So um, it sounds like, oh, the bottom half's super useful. Yeah, but we've got another version already that may be better. So. Uh, it's one I use in the melee build, but I rotate it out pretty early. The range build, I keep it for a while, though, because um, just having the enemy just constantly going forward and giving some bonus attack threes, especially when you're going to be burning shadows anyway, it's not bad. Anger of the Dead. Uh, this is one we use just a little bit in the melee build, just because you want the initiative 14. Um, 
The bottom half's pretty useful for no matter what you're doing. So even if you rotate this out, you might want to use it to first off A, just for the initiative 14, and B, the wounding thing actually could be potentially useful. However, since you're having a little bit of shadow control difficulty uh, with the melee build, you might not be able to use it as well. And the range build's pretty nice because if you do end up creating too many shadows, uh, you might just say, hey, I want to vacuum them all up and put it in one big attack and then just say, hey, let's move on to the next room. I've eaten all my shadows. That's great. Uh, and it's useful for that. Also, there are some particularly annoying shielded enemies in Frosthaven that we noticed Anger of the Dead ended up being incredible for the purpose of just like, uh, oh, I have two shadows on the ground. Uh, what, there's an annoying enemy. Like, just turn it into attack four, pierce two at the cost of two shadows, which gives you two experience, because every shadow you burn gives you an experience. This is a huge card, all with an initiative 14. It's incredible. I love this for the range build. I ended up swapping it, I think, the cards for Vengeful Storm later, and, uh, because I love the cards that allow you to vacuum up a bunch of shadows and put it into one big attack. Um, there's just a couple of those, but this is the first one that I end up liking. Wave of Anguish. Now this is kind of what we end up wanting for the melee build, not for the top effect, but for the bottom effect. Um, it does a lot of what you want, but very little. Uh, move 2 is not bad, obviously you can do that normally, however it allows you to adjust every shadow up to 1. Now potentially if you're pretty close to an enemy and there's a shadow pretty close to an enemy, it allows you to push everything you want in the right direction, especially if you just need to get in the right spot. Um, so. I'm not, it's not huge, but being able to adjust to every shadow by one might just get um, the shadow you need where you need to be so you can move to be standing in it for the level two card or for the perk or for other things. Well, going forward, we're going to just talk about um, how we um, are going to be moving, changing positioning with this card. Uh, for the range build, however, I do like the fact it's a loss, but then you turn every shadow into an attack three. And even on the melee build, you can kind of use this, but it'll end up being more useful for that effect later. We will rotate this out, but um, I like this in the melee build just because it gives you a lot of versatility. Morsel Spirits is good because the bottom half is straight up uh, teleport into or adjacent to any any shadow. So no matter where you are on the board, this is a very good card. It ends up being a little stronger, although the Sunless Apparition gives you a loot with it, which is good. Uh, the Sunless Apparition, you must teleport into the Hex, and this says adjacent to, which you cannot imagine how much that makes a world of difference. Additionally, the Forceful Spirits is one I don't like as much for the range build, even though it is a range attack. You have to get really close. It's a range two card. There's no like way to increase the range except for with some cards, but um, with some items. But ultimately, I rely more on the melee build using it because with the dark, you can do two attack threes at level one. You do need the dark element to play to get that, but they do need to be within range two. And often with the melee build, you will be close. So I leaned more on this on the melee build than I did on the range build. Uh, rest in the shade, the movement bottom's a loss, which uh, wouldn't be awful if the top was better, but the top is like requiring people to be in shadows and heal. I'm gonna be honest, I just don't like this card, so I never ended up really using it very much for any build. Restless Spirits. So we're actually taking this only on the melee build. So the bottom half is move a shadow four, not great. However, it can potentially take the place of Dark Fog because it allows you to move five, one shadow. Here's the thing though, you could potentially move it through an enemy and make them suffer three damage, gain an experience, suffer raw damage. This is going to be sometimes useful for the melee build. The top is an attack three curse, which isn't great, but it's not bad. It's, 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 it's okay. Um, it does give you uh, the ability to curse things. If you can get into position, it is an attack six curse, which is huge. But you need to be, you need to have a shadow adjacent to an enemy. Then you need to be able to move to that shadow and then attack that enemy. So now it sounds like, oh, you should be able to pull that off. It's a little bit harder at lower levels than you think. But as you start to unlock other cards later, it, it's much easier to set up. So if you have more shadows on the board, which we will be able to more reliably get later and be able to move them more later, um, between this and Strike the Abyss, it gives you a couple abilities to do attack sixes uh, every rest cycle. Deepening Despair reminds me of Fluid Knight. However, you need to have two shadows next to an enemy and it, it gives you dark. But you don't remove the shadows, which is great. But you do need to be able to move the shadows. Uh, luckily, the range build does have the capacity to do that. But if you do that, you get to infuse dark and get an attack four. It ends up being pretty solid. 
Additionally, the bottom half allows you and allies to effectively use shadows as like a gateway between other shadows. You can move through them. Great. I love that effect. It's fantastic. And then you get to move three along with it. So you could, if you're near a shadow, you can then start moving through. Now the gifts, the fact that it helps allies is great. Additionally, I want to point out that this is a good ranged attack and some utility on an initiative 11. So there's a couple of annoying cards in initiative 13 and 14 in addition to the 15 that we've seen already on some Gloomhaven ones that make this initiative a little bit more appealing once you start to learn the Frosthaven enemy behaviors. Deadbolt! I use this for the range build. It's kind of really easy to explain. You can move all, all the hexes a bunch. Just being able to move all your shadows three hexes is very powerful, especially when you're talking about the previous card, Deepening Despair. And you'd almost think like, hey, that's a lot for like, maybe the melee build uses this. I'm gonna go over the other card here in a minute, but the, you don't wanna do that for the melee build because it doesn't move you. And being able to move all three is good. So I mean, honestly, you might even consider it. However, the top half of the range build is an attack three at range four, which is still good. And if you have dark, you can actually end up just tossing curses into the deck. You already have other ways to curse. So being able to throw out, um, to convert darks into curses and still have a long range attack three that doesn't actually require shadows or dark element to be able to get that both the good range and the good attack means this is a pretty useful card for that build. Ritual, sac Ritual Sacrifice, I love this card. Uh, so this is an attack three and then you get plus one for every shadow in them or next to them. So when I said we need to get a lot of shadow movement, this is it. A lot of the times though, this is going to mostly be an attack five, but you will be able to largely later get attack sixes and sevens, and then sometimes attack eights. I haven't gotten that often, but a lot of times it ends up being more sixes and sevens. It's really hard to complain about that. We're gonna talk about another card. I, I keep talking about it, it's medium. Medium's the card we're talking about. Additionally, initiative 13, move to infuse dark non-loss is good. It has the shield effect where you can turn a bunch of shadows into shields, that get that does get used sometimes. Um, there's this fun scenario where basically it's one of those where there's a time limit and then people need to survive that we ended up winning because we just said, hey, guess what? Everyone, we get, I think it was shield four, shield five. I can't remember, but like it was such a big shield that it didn't matter what was drawn. We won the scenario. We didn't have to survive 10 rounds. We had to survive nine. Fleeting Dusk. Um, you might use this on the melee build. Being able to generate another shadow is pretty solid, but I like, I'm gonna go over pulled across why I like it more for the melee build here in a second. But I like this for the range build because it gives you another one of those uh, turn one thing into a big boom. So now you do a bunch of attack threes just based off of where you have one shadow and then every enemy that survives is wounded. So it effectively does one more damage to all those enemies. It's pretty fantastic. The bottom half also allows you to generate shadows with a non-loss on the bottom. Additionally, since a lot of the bottoms um, don't, you don't have a lot of like really great generation at the bottom and you sometimes will end up using them like just to move. Being able to say like, oh, you know what? I don't have any good bottoms right now because I you either will have shadows in the right place. There's just some times where it just doesn't feel good. Throwing in another shadow generation ends up just being really fun. So I love the fact that the bottom half of this is just more shadows and the top half is a super useful boom. Love it. Pulled across. I used the top half a little bit in the range build. The melee part, the melee build uses the bottom, which but I'm going to talk about this, why I didn't pick this for the range build. A lot of times because you end up holding back and I largely only played with three or four players. I didn't need the invisibility a lot, especially with the new invisibility rules where people just move through you. I wasn't able to just move through onto doors, be invisible and then screw with enemies. They just move through and attack my allies. Or um, I wasn't even in range to be attacked. So the invisibility didn't end up doing as much. Don't get me wrong, it was useful, but I ended up just wanting to use Fleeting Dusk more with the um, with the range build. And the range build, being able to convert a shadow and a loss into one bane, didn't end up being as useful. Where I actually did use this on the melee build sometimes where I'm like, all right, you know what? Just We need to just take that enemy out and it, it worked a couple times. But for the most of the time, you're going to be saying, hey, this is a, I get dark, which is something you need. I need to move, which is something you need. And the most important part, being up in melee and then being invisible for that round, and then being able to be invisible until the end of your next turn, you can, because you do have a couple of those late initiatives, you can have a couple turns where your low health doesn't matter because you're invisible. And then you kind of end up being an obstacle for enemies. Um, the bottom half ended up being incredibly valuable. Medium, so this is the big thing for the melee. And don't get me wrong, I think a lot of people are gonna look at the top half of this and go like, like, holy crap, 
This is a non-loss attack five. I don't need these positions. I just need dark and play, which is pretty easy to get. And it is easy to get, but I didn't end up using the top hats as often. Now, initially I kind of discounted this card on like, um, in the early play testing. Cause I'm like, um, we did, first off, some of the cards did change over the course of play testing, as it should, but um, I kind of underestimated the bottom half of this, which said, every time you start your turn, move a Shadow 3. Sweet. So, uh, this is the part I underestimated. If you need enemies, like, to be able to stand in a thing for um, uh, the level 2 card, uh, behold, you just, being able to move a Shadow 3 and then take your turn, it's very easy to move into that shadow and then attack the enemy with that card. Boom, easy attack six. And you know how I said like, I need a shadows at a certain spot just to so I can pile them around one enemy for a big attack? Guess what, you just move it there. I mean, even if you use the other bottom house to move shadows into spot spaces, now every turn you get shadows where you need to be. Three, three, three. All you have to do is start your turn. And then you still get two halves to do other things. I can't overstate how much of an effect this had on the melee build and like its usefulness and how often it was much more able to get attack sixes. So uh, the whole point of the melee build for me was to get find out ways to get attacks um, multiple, like attack six, attack six, attack six or higher every rest. Um, eventually after I had enough um, so some of the other shadow movement cards and movement cards as well as the three attack three attacks in particular i was able to reliably every rest cycle be able to attack six except for i think on the first one i need to go back to my reference sheet but it was, after after the first rest cycle i was attack six three times every rest potentially and then some of the other ones higher and it was after I unlock this card. So the melee build really starts to take off once you can play the bottom half of this. Dominate. Now, I first want to go say that bottom half is just, hey, move forward and fuse dark. Hard to bitch about that. The top half, however, should sound familiar. It's like Fluid Knight, except uh, unlike Fluid Knight, it doesn't infuse dark. So you, you turn, you just destroy one of your shadows and do an attack six and then one experience is great. However, if you have dark in play, you can turn that into a disarm. So if they survive that attack six, they're not doing any attacks. I love it. Um, so not only that, but like a, a pretty strong ranged attack that just needs shadow, one shadow in a position and potentially one shadow in dark. So that's something you might need. Now, of course, disarms are great because there isn't much hard crowd control. And this is something you will want. Um, but uh, I, I the, even then, sort of like, well, it's a pretty good top that we can use. Absolutely, but it's also a pretty good bottom. So because both of them are so good, and because it's on the same level as medium, the melee build really can't use it, but the range build absolutely will because it doesn't need a medium as much. The knight takes shape. Um, I wanted to like this as the range build, and don't get me wrong, I do, but um, it's just kind of harder to use. Um, I do think that, by the way, no matter what build, if you do want to use that summon, I think the melee build is much harder to use it, and the range build found ways to use it. So if this is one of those, because it has a good health pool and it has the ability to just, it's a non-loss summon and it gives all attacks against a disadvantage in the fact that you can toss curses in. I, I was surprised at how much this can actually add to your survivability. It does require you to burn two shadows, so I will warn you that that's a pretty big cost. However, it's pretty useful. Um, stays alive longer than I thought. I love it. Um, this especially paired well when we uh, were using it with um, either the Banner Spear or the Bone Shaper. So consider that. Um, however, for the most part, we're not going to be talking about the summon. It's more of an optional, and I do strongly think if you want to play it, it's useful, and try it out. I'm not going to advise it for both builds, but that doesn't mean it's bad. It just means there's an asterisk nest to it. We will be taking this card on the melee build, and I think a lot of people look at this whole card and think, I don't necessarily want to do all that. So let's first read, because you can skip parts of the card. So the worst part of this card at worst, the bottom is an attack three. Melee attack three, boom, you're a melee build. If you're already in a melee position, toss in another melee attack three. That's fine, but it can do notably more. Move one shadow, three hexes. Great, so you can move a shadow three and then also attack, great. Now you could maybe just move and teleport because the second part is a teleport. You do have to burn the shadow, which isn't great for the melee build, but you may or may not even need to want to use the teleport. But however, if you have a shadow in the right spot, you may just want to get there. So it'll, it may cost a shadow, but maybe a shadow is worth to get where you need to be. Especially if you move teleport next to an enemy and then 
hit them. I mean, it, it can be absolutely useful. So, um, and then you can do an attack three on them. So don't consider all parts of the card mandatory. So you can create, move the shadow, don't do the teleport, and then attack three. You can just do the attack three. You can just move a shadow and you're not in position to do the attack. So consider every part. However, you can only do the teleport if you move the shadow because you have to teleport to the move shadow. So I just want to put that in particular. But because it does all of those, that's so strong on a non-loss bottom half of a card that this ends up adding a lot of power to the melee build. Especially when you have medium where you can just move the move a shadow three. So you can like move a shadow where you need it to be and then move another shadow where you need it to be. Uh, you can potentially move it onto a uh, hex next to them, teleport to them, do one of those things, and, um, one of your attacks on them, and then turn them into a shadow. And then after doing an attack three, and I, I, I can't overstate how much damage output this actually changes because being able to move to enemies or even just straight up doing one of your big attacks um, and then like killing the enemy, making that shadow move over to another enemy, then... Um, teleporting over to that spot and then doing the attack three on another enemy like there's so much damage output you can start doing i love the fact that we now have a bottom half attack on the melee build hey vengeful storm let's first talk about the loss part first off i love the initiative 18 the initiative 18 on the card is pretty good um i love cards the initiative 18 is good especially on hard crowd control but the top or large are going to be doing and we're talking about how you can potentially blow up a room but let's just talk about the bottom first you designate one of your shadows you don't blow it up Every enemy adjacent to that shadow is stunned, which is great. I know it's a loss, but then they're also wounded. That's also because they're wounded, first off, because they're stunned, they'll spend the next turn just suffering one damage and doing nothing. Then they'll spend the next turn taking one damage. So as long as you can get them to two, or even if they're at two, it's a death sentence. Uh, it doesn't matter what they've got, shield or otherwise, you are going to kill them. Uh, not only that, but uh, being able to apply wound and stun, it's the best crowd control combo. I love it. So combined with the 18 is this is an incredibly powerful card. However, the top half is what we like it. So it's an attack three at range four, which is fine. Um, it gives you a pretty strong, it's an unconditional attack. So you can attack three range four. You don't need dark. You don't need a shadow. It's it. However, every shadow you burn gives you another shadow. So another attack. So if you're like, well, I need to attack those three guys over there burn two shadows near you they don't even need to be near the enemy you just need to be near them burn as many shadows as you want and target that many additional enemies this ends up being one of your big bombs that makes you like it felt made me feel like more like the spell we've ever had all those big like trying to line up attacks however a lot of times times you don't need to like line it up like the earthen spike or the um get things in a certain formation all you need to do is be within range four of them and then every shadow that you burn gives you another attack so this is another one that ends up being like one of those i'm gonna vacuum up all my shadows and just do as many attacks now this doesn't soup up one attack it gives you many attacks so it gives you, you it gives you one another vacuum for them, but I end up much preferring this because a lot of times, and I, like I say, I play at three or four players more often. So I end up liking this more because there's often a lot of enemies. So uh, being able to just convert that into a lot of ranged damage, and you'll be able to tag one of those enemies potentially if you're careful on how you do it because if you don't have an enemy tagged or if you have an enemy tagged and you see an enemy that's weak, try to finish them off make them turn into a shadow. Then continue with the attack one at a time and saying, hey, now I'm gonna tag this one. You could potentially turn this into more shadows afterwards. Now, you, you have to be a little creative and some people don't really care about the nuance of that, but just keep that in mind. Proliferation of the Abyss. Now, I'm gonna talk about the bottom half because I am I use the bottom half in both builds. First off, you move two, or if you have dark, you move four. So that's already decent. To convert dark into a move four is not great as long as you have another effect. And now this allows you to move two shadows up to four. Now with medium, and um, that means the melee build, you can move one shadow three and then potentially that shadow four or more or two more shadows up to two. This means that some of your cards that require you to get those, like you need to get three things next to the enemy or you need to step into a shadow, like. Boom, you're gonna very easily be able to set this up super easy just to have the bottom of this card, non-loss. But for the range build, it allows you to move and then get the shadows where you need to be to perform some of the attacks that require enemies like, you know, dominate, uh, deepening despair or fluid night. The top half ends up being pretty situational as well because you can now say, hey, um, I have now a conditional, as, as long as there's a shadow, we're gonna stop the damage from happening. 
you do have to destroy the shadow. The shadow needs to be in the right position and you need to, um, and you do get an experience for it. And it persists in play long enough for you to hold it and then you can say, no, I don't want that hit. You can time this pretty well and it ends up being pretty powerful. Another big asterisk that I actually like about this card is if you do have, if dark is infused, when you have it, you actually create a shadow. Non-loss create a shadow as part of this action, which is great. Now, um, I didn't end up using this top as much. Don't get me wrong. It's useful and there's certain scenarios. Uh, I can think of one boss fight that I can't talk about that this ended up paying off a lot. So don't get me wrong. The top's good, but I didn't end up using the top as often as I ended up using the bottom. Hungry grasps, I'm not a big fan of. So potentially you have two shadows that perform, each of them perform an attack three and then pull them towards them, which isn't bad. No, this is effectively like an attack, two different attack threes on a high level card. And then it pulls them potentially away. A lot of times, I don't I don't know, I, I guess every time I felt underwhelmed and it felt like a lower level card. And the bottom half is a loss that potentially you can turn into a bunch of blesses and heals. But um, I, I, I don't know. I never really felt like it was worth the level it was for me. It, it, it wasn't awful. So when we ended up testing it, I ended up being pretty whelmed by it and ended up just leaning on proliferation for all of my builds from that point on. Lashing Tendrils. I think if you want to take this, take it. I ended up using the other card for both builds, but I do want to talk about this. Um, getting that bonus uh, Retaliate. Number one, for the Spike Bell Drift Drifter build that we did as a joke, we added this card. And this is a, how one of the ways we pretty easily got to um, like adding more shields and retaliate four and five reliably on this stupid drifter build that I thought was a joke. I think we got to like retaliate six on some turn. It was stupid. It was the dumbest build ever. And it worked. That's the part. It was, but we were like having a high level drifter and a high level death walker. Like, let's do meme builds. And this is part of that meme team that ended up like, hey, we're we're winning scenarios on hard difficulty. Are, are they actually are they actually memes if you win like like we, we were making dumb belts as a joke so like i'm gonna do a a death walker retaliate aura i'm gonna do a retaliate drifter and we're gonna see if we can make the enemies kill themselves to death you can it will work now it required a little bit more teamwork and stuff but so it's not gonna work all the time and the bottom half of this requires you to like have dark in a play to be able to suffer the two damage otherwise it's kind of like a weaker version of some of your other cards it's not bad because it can be really strong with that Suffer 5, but I ended up just liking Frozen in Fear a little bit more, even with the melee build. So let's talk about that. First off, pick one of your shadows, then every enemy within range one of that shadow gets immobilized. Pretty good because you can potentially save your own ass as a melee build, or as a range build, if you want to keep enemies away, you can just move a shadow in position and immobilize all the enemies. That's great. It allows you some nice hard crowd control, which is hard to find in this, in Frosthaven. Number two, all immobilized enemies suffer two damage, or if you consume dark as part of the action, three damage. So since you're gonna be immobilizing them anyway, um, being able to um, just straight up do two true damage to them is very strong. So I even like this on the melee build. Additionally, the initiative 21 is something you kind of want on hard crowd control. The bottom half obviously gives you some two free shadows and a lot of shadow movement, but um, it, it, it's one of those that's useful because sometimes you do just want more shadows and you do need it and towards the end of a scenario it absolutely ends up stacking it's it's, it's very beneficial but um it's 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 got an asterisk that the top ends up being very strong as a form of crowd control especially if you're trying to intermix like uh either your high damage attacks or some of your other shadow generators or crowd control that the top ends up being very strong as that option i don't like the part that I'm like more iffy on it is I don't like a conditional crowd control thing on top with a loss on bottom. So it's not a super card. So it's not why that's why I have a little bit less enthusiasm about it, but it's still a good card. When your time comes, I love this for the range build. First off, because it's a range attack. Um, just being able to do first off, it's weak, but it's very strong. Uh, uh, an attack two is weak. Being able to curse the enemy is nice and being able to get dark is nice. However, this card persists until the enemy dies and then every enemy next to it suffers for true damage. So as long as you find ways to get those enemies to blow up and you then that enemy, because it was like you know, call to the abyss, you now turn them into a shadow and they can start do stuff with that. It's so funny because I was like, eh, 
it's okay as a tech to a curse, but non-lost curse. Being able to shuffle that in and then have it make the enemies explode because you can communicate with allies like, hey, I want to do that. Let's put that guy in the middle there. Let's blow him up because focus firing one person then ends up adding more raw damage that ends up turning it into an AoE. So it sounds like it's a little conditional, but with planning, uh, it's a lot of damage. Speaking of a lot of damage, Black Lance. So this is a joke because it's hilarious. So remember how I was saying like I could reliably do attack sixes through eights um, once I got the thing set up. So the level nine Deathwalker, I uh, was using this with a certain boots. I think it's renamed uh, and I think it's spoiler, but let it be known that there are ways to get more movement on this. But with medium and get, getting a certain amount of um, shadow movement, it's actually pretty easy to get a line of shadows where you need to, to charge through. It's pretty simple to set this up as a non-loss attack 10. I kid you not. Now, I did get... Some, did you get attack 13s? Yeah, I, I forget exactly. I think the highest raw... I mean, I don't I don't remember the highest... But the actual damage of some of the attacks because we're like, can we make this as a, like a joke? We absolutely got attacks... Um, <laughs> attacks on this above like 16 and 18. Non-loss 16 and 18s. Um, via some, some creativity, mind you. But I just think that this is so silly. And I'm like, well, how often can you get an attack 10? Every time I played it, I was able to get attack 10 or better. Now, attack 10 felt like the floor. Now, of course, you're like, uh, I mean, I'm sure I, maybe I don't even remember ever, ever being seven. I think the lowest I ever got this was 10. It's dumb. I love it. So not only does it give you a move and attack 10 or higher, usually because of the way you have it set up, that's just the top half. So you can still pair a bottom uh, with it. To get in the right position or to move the shadows where you need to which is often something you will need to do but sometimes just having medium and the, the battlefield can just get you something where you need to be <laughs> and even then if you're not using it for that which you should but the bottom half is a nice jump for v is dark and if you did move through enemies you shuffle a number of curses into the monster deck you'll do them a number of enemies you move through ends up also being good for the melee build. Now it sounds fun for the range build to toss more of those, but you need to be moving around enemies, which isn't great. So um, both halves end up being much better for the melee build. For the range build, I drop Forceful Spirits, Eclipse, Call of Doom, Dark Fog, Anger of the Dead, and then Lingering Rot. Bla finally drop Black Barrage and then uh, Wave of Anguish for the range build. And uh, with the Deepening Despair, Deadbolt, Fleeting Dusk, Dominate, Vengeful Storm, Proliferation, Frozen in Fear, and then When Your Time Comes. For the melee build, um, we swapped out Fluid Knight for Restless Spirits. Like I said, we're going to drop that early. Sunless Apparition for Ritual Sacrifice. Then we drop Call of Doom, Dark Fog, Forceful Spirits, Wave of Anguish, Shadow Step, and then finally drop Eclipse at level 9. For the range build, uh, for both builds we want to first off get uh, remove the two minus one cards and then remove the two minus two. The range build, I start replacing the zeros with ones pretty early because you'll be able to shuffle more curses in and it gives you more consistency. And then um, if you want to, uh, ignore scenario effects and add the plus twos. Uh, the, the, the melee build, I'm going to do something different because the melee build needs dark more often. We're going to take that before we start swapping out the zeros for plus ones. And we're going to be using the short, per short rest perk instead. The short rest allows you to convert dark into curses just every time you short rest, as long as dark's infused. You can time this pretty easily too, and um, just being able to throw in more curses uh, improves your own survivability because you are a melee build. I do try to go invisible for some of those with um, pulled across, but um, let's face it, you can't do it for everything, and even then, it only lasts for a little bit. So, um, and also that helps your your, your allies too. So keep that in mind. Um, uh, and I found myself long resting less often with the melee build because sometimes I was just too close to enemies and it just, there just wasn't a time to long rest. And I found the ability to long rest more with the range build. And there we have it, the Deathwalker. I, I strongly suggest that if you want to play a semi-complicated class but not be overwhelmed like the Blink Blade, the Deathwalker is great and the range build is actually pretty easy to grasp. If you want a challenge, I would strongly recommend playing the melee Deathwalker because my per from my personal experience, the damage output is notably... It's actually one of the strongest. The Deathwalker is one of my favorite melee characters at the moment because of that. So um, my Drifter build ended up being uh, kind of fun, but my Drifter build ended up doing less effort than my Deathwalker build. So I strongly suggest if you want to try that, do step through that. I, it is a strong build and it's very competitive. So... Um, <clears throat> If you do, let me know. Put in the comments by the time. I know it's, we've got a little bit until the Frosthaven, but um, if you do end up using this guide to build a melee build, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear it. 
So we have other class guides coming up and we're going to be going over Crimson Scales. So if you're excited over that, please be sure to follow because I'm going to be doing uh, an unboxing and we're going to be going over not only the miniatures, but the campaign itself. I would like to thank all the patrons for supporting us. You guys are amazing. I love you and keep being awesome. And thanks all of you for watching.